Topic Notes 11.3, Higher Invertebrates. Now previously we've talked about sponges, cnidarians, and tenophores, which were relatively simple. Now we're going to get into a little bit more complex invertebrates. Again, our main ideas here are that invertebrates include some of the most diverse animal groups on the planet, they exhibit a vast range of adaptations, and play critical, critical roles in the marine environment. Along the way, you should be able to describe their basic characteristics, nutrition, reproduction, and ecological roles in various different invertebrate phyla that we're going to study, and you should be able to discuss how invertebrate phyla are classified based on evolutionary connections. And so these are the main points we're going to focus on. We're going to go through a lot of information, but remember, those are sort of the key components that you want to hold on to. Okay, first up we have phylum mollusca. Uh, and the Latin molluscus means soft, and these are soft-bodied animals. So that makes a certain amount of sense. Here you see an octopus. So big characteristic of this group is that they're soft-bodied. And they are unsegmented, so unsegmented soft bodies we often talk about. Now this makes a big difference when we talk about the next phylum that we're going to get into, but we won't get confused yet. So also, most mollusks, for the most part, are known for having an external shell of some sort. Think about snails and conchs, things like that, that are made out of calcium carbonate. Now, some mollusks will have an internal shell, and some don't have a shell at all, so that does kind of go without saying. Now, the shell, when they do have it, is made out of a combination of calcium carbonate and a protective binding protein called conklin. And if you look at the general mollusk diagram on the bottom of the screen there, you'll see the shell is uh, sort of that gray matter, and then you'll see the blue. That blue layer is tissue layer called mantle, and that mantle actually secretes the shell, and it, that shell continues to grow throughout the mollusk's life. You'll also see in this diagram on the very bottom, the sort of pink layer, is the muscular foot. That provides locomotion. That's how conchs move around and most snails move around as well. In other forms of mollusks, the, that muscular foot might be turned into tentacles, for example. So that's that. Between the mantle and the muscular foot, you have this kind of big mass, which is the visceral mass, and that's where you find most of your organs. Now, most mollusks have open circulatory systems, which means they don't have all of their uh, blood fluids uh, in vessels. They actually do have some vessels, but it actually is open most of their body. Uh, and they are triploblastic, which means we are finally getting to our first group, our first phylum that has all three of the tissue layers, the germ layers. That would be the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm, all three. They are also protostomes. So that first opening in the blast pore, uh, as the little ball of cells is dividing up, is going to become the mouth. Now I'm going to mention very briefly here the nervous system um, because in previously when we talked about things like sponges there really wasn't a nervous system. When we talked about cnidarians they had a very simple nerve net. Well mollusks have taken that a bit further. They actually have what we call paired ganglia uh, which are kind of these bunches of nerve clusters, and they're connected by a series of nerve cords, sort of like a rope and ladder sort of system. And along with this, they also have sensory organs, tentacles, eyes, and chemoreceptors, so they are really fully engaged with their environment. There is so much diversity here, so we're going to start with class gastropoda, also known as stomach foot when you uh, look at the Greek and Latin. And this would be your snails, your conchs. Uh, in, in the middle there, you'll see uh, a sea hare. Uh, you have limpets. You have uh, nudibranchs on the far right without the exterior shell. Just a huge amount of diversity just within this class. Now we're going to go to class bivalvia, which is known for having two valved shell, two halves to the shell, if you will. And here's some very familiar things like clams and oysters. And on the right is something maybe a little less familiar, which is shipworms. And they bore into wood 
um, driftwood or ships, <laughs> which is why they got their name, uh, and start to degrade it. So they're actually kind of important to the system as well. Then we have class Cephalopoda. Um, this would be your octopus, your squid, and your nautilus. These guys are pretty much one of the more extreme morphologies within the phyla, um, but they're also some of the most intelligent, so they're very cool. And last phyla, a class we'll look at is class Polyplacophora, and these are your chitons, and they are an eight-segmented shell. Um, you, we have what we call hairy chitons around here, where you've got kind of this fuzziness around them. Uh, but they're very cool. They're not that big here locally, but you can find them relatively large uh, in the picture on the left in the Indo-Pacific. But they are very cool, and that's that eight-segmented shell, which gives them their uniqueness. So talk about nutrition. These guys are all over the map. We have herbivores. We have carnivores. We have deposit feeders. We have filter feeders. They run the gamut. But one of the most unique features that you'll see in the majority of mollusks classes except for bivalves is what we call the radula and the radula is this uh, ribbon of tissue with teeth on it uh, that it uses to scrape uh, a lot of times algae off of rocks uh, pierce into a prey item or even tear or cut uh, flesh and even drill into other mollusk shells to feed on them so the radula is a quite adaptable uh, feature across several of these classes in terms of reproduction, there's still quite a lot of variability, but for the most part, most of uh, the various different mollusks are dioecious, meaning they have separate male and female individuals. Um, they do have a, what we call a ciliated trochophore larvae initially that's actually linked to annelids, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then uh, they also have larval forms that are villager larvae. Uh, and these villager larvae, I love, they're so cute, I think, in terms of plankton. Um, they uh, look like big Dumbo ears to me on either side of them. That's the picture on the right, by the way, uh, with a little uh, uh, snout coming out in the middle, which kind of reminds me of an elephant. Now it says here external fertilization in most. However, there are some that lay eggs. There are some that use uh, spermatophore packages like squid. So there is quite a wide variety here as well. Now mollusks are very important as a food source. Not only for humans, which a lot of people like to eat uh, various types of, uh, you know, shellfish and whatnot, um, but also for other animals. They are food sources, not only in their larval planktonic forms, but also uh, in their adult forms as well. The shells provide habitats for other species. For example, uh, the hermit crab there in the middle of the, of the pictures down there. Shipworms are really important for breaking down various types of wood that find themselves in the environment. This also includes wooden ships, which you know, we don't have as many of anymore, but they're still there. Uh, and interestingly enough, they're a really good component for uh, coastal restoration. Uh, the picture on the right is a bed of oysters, and those oysters act as filters to help clean the water up uh, to, to make that actually, in fact, the Lake Worth Lagoon, these are projects at Guam where we try and input some of these oyster beds to try and help clean up the Lake Worth Lagoon. So, uh, as a water filter, they're very important as well. The next phylum on our list is phylum Annelida. Uh, the Latin here is annulus, which means little ring, and this will make sense in a second. By the way, these are Christmas tree worms, and yes, those headdresses, those pretty little colors, are coming from a worm. The major characteristic for phylum Annelida is a soft body divided into segments. So unlike mollusks, which had a soft body, but they were unsegmented. Here we have a soft body that is segmented. So it's a segmented soft body. And these segments are both internal and external. They are bilaterally symmetrical. They have a hydrostatic skeleton, meaning that they use water pressure to hold their form. They have a closed circulatory system. They are triploblastic, so they have all three germ layers, and they're also protostomes. So their, uh, their first blast pore opening is a mouth. Now, in terms of the classes, there's two that we're going to look at. First is class Oligochida, and this is the one thing that's probably the most familiar to you about annelids. They're earthworms. I'm sure some of you have played with them sometime during your childhood, uh, if not just putting them on a hook to go fishing. 
Uh, but earthworms are the terrestrial version of annelids. What we're going to be talking mostly about would be class Polychaeta, which are the marine worms. And the marine worms do look a little bit like earthworms in terms of their segmentation and you know their worms, but they actually have a lot more diversity. And most of them all possess paddle-like parapodia, uh, which are, are shown on the right. If you see, that's the nearest worm. And you can see the different, uh, these like paddle-like extensions coming out. Uh, from the side, from each individual segment, two, one on either side. On the left, you'll see a bearded fireworm, uh, and each of its parapodia has a ton of little fuzzy, like white bristles coming off of it. And these um, actually have a bit of a neurotoxin in them. They're really uh, very painful if you get stuck by them, which is why they're called a fireworm. Now, in terms of nutrition with polychaetes, um, they, well, and this goes with all worms, they have a linear digestive tract that sort of goes from one to the other, so it's relatively simplistic. But in terms of what they eat, it's quite diverse. Feather dusters, for example, on the bottom left, uh, those are filter feeders, suspension feeders. They take particulates out of the water and they eat them, a lot of plankton. Uh, Aranicula, or the lug, lugworm, which is there in the middle, um, is a deposit feeder. They create these U-type uh, tubes in the sediments and estuaries, and they deposit feed. Uh, over on the right, the bobbit worm is a major predator. Uh, they go after all sorts of uh, invertebrates and crabs and shrimps and things like that. Now for reproduction, um, again, there's quite a few different methodologies. This is a, a relatively big uh, phylum in class. Uh, through asexual reproduction, you have a lot of budding and division. They have a lot of powers of regeneration, so a lot of different polygates can regrow things. Um, through sexual reproduction, uh, a lot of them are, they can be either dioecious or hermaphroditic, so it can go either way. Um, they will exhibit things like internal egg brooding, uh, in which the eggs are actually burst out from them. You can also have external fertilization. And just a few different species actually uh, exhibit this weird um, particular design where they grow this weird reproductive segment on the back end of their bodies that eventually breaks off and goes free swimming in the water. It's called an epitoki. And the picture on the left bottom there shows a bunch of them swarming in the water around some divers. So, like I said, there are a ton of different options and uh, reproductive strategies found here. The picture on the right is of a larval polychaete, and we see them quite a few times in our plankton toes here in class two. Uh, you never know exactly what it's going to grow up into unless you are a larval biologist, but they're very cool to look at. Because so many of the polychaetes actually grow in benthic sediments, uh, there is a huge component to nutrient cycling uh, that they help provide within the environment. They also provide habitat. The images on the bottom here exhibit a parchment tube worm, or catopteryx, and this is a, a really cool worm, and the worm is actually in the middle segment of this image. Um, it looks very alien-like, but it creates this U-bend uh, tube. Uh, and so a lot of these different worms that create these tubes will have other things that live in the tubes with them. Uh, the parchment tube worm specifically creates a water current and it filter feeds out of that current. So either way, a lot of these worms provide that link in the food web between the detritus and the deposits on the bottom and different trophic levels, not to mention the filter feeders that obviously do that same uh, segment there. Now it's time for Superphylum Arthropoda. It's really just the arthropods world. We're just here living on it. So if we break down Greek, arthro means joint, and podos foot. So jointed foot is sort of the loose translation. So arthropods are really known for having this chitinous exoskeleton, this hard outer exoskeleton composed of protein, chitin, and calcium salts or calcium carbonate. And along with this suit of armor, just like Iron Man, uh, they have to have jointed appendages so that they can move this armor around and be uh, able to experience and manipulate their environment. So if I ask what's the major characteristic here, you should say a hard exoskeleton and jointed appendages. Now the arthropod body is generally divided up into segments. You have the head, 
the thorax, the abdomen, and the telson. You can see that diagrammed out with the lobster on the right picture there. Now, because their exoskeletons are hard and no longer living, um, that's a bit of an issue if you want to get bigger and grow. So all arthropods have to go through a molting process in which they shed their old exoskeleton and form a new one in order to get larger. And these series of pictures you'll see from the top to the bottom shows a blue crab basically exiting its exoskeleton. It's kind of that middle picture is it kind of uh, getting out of it and then leaving the older exoskeleton behind in the bottom picture. The new exoskeletons are generally very soft when they first uh, emerge with them, and they kind of blow themselves up with water and make themselves a little bigger before the exoskeleton hardens and becomes the new one. Now, in terms of diversity, arthropods by far are the largest animal group. In fact, 75% of all known species are arthropods. Arthropods far outnumber us completely, hands down, they win. So if you've noticed, we called arthropoda a superphylum. Uh, now this is as classification has evolved and we've learned more, we've started to reclassify a few things and this is one of them. So now we have superphylum arthropoda and several subphylums. And the first subphylum is Trilobitomorpha. This subphylum is currently extinct. There are none left living on earth that we know of. Now trilobites were quite diverse in their time. They first appeared in the early uh, Cambrian around 521 million years ago and went extinct during the Permian mass extinction around 250 million years ago. That's a long run. The next subphylum is subphylum Chelicerata. And one of the things I want you to keep note of is I'm talking about a subphylum. Remember, this is not far down from kingdom level. So a lot of the organisms you see within this subphylum are not as closely related as you would think. Now here we have things like you might be familiar with a horseshoe crab on the left and other things that, you know, maybe you're a little freaked out about like uh, spiders and scorpions. And on the right side is a sea spider. Now sea spiders are not grouped with spiders. They are within the same subphylum Chelicerata, but they are in different uh, classification groupings below that level. So do keep that in mind as you go forward. These are very diverse groups. We literally could spend whole courses on each of these segments. And here's where it gets even more diverse. We have the overall arching characteristic of mandibulates, those that have appendages that can chew food. And there are three subphylums that exhibit this characteristic. Subphylum crustacea, which are your marine mandibulates, the ones we're going to spend the most time with, like crabs and shrimps and things. And then we have subphylum hexapoda, which would be all of your insects, which I know we're not going to talk about much because we're in a marine science class, but this is huge for the terrestrial habitats. And then, of course, subphylum uh, miropoda, which are your millipedes and centipedes. Now we're going to go into just the crustaceans and look at some of their specific characteristics. Now, crustaceans have what we call biramous appendages, basically meaning they're split near the base into two branches, two being bi. Uh, they also have paired antenna, and they have three pairs of mouth parts, mandibles and two sets of what we call maxilla. So these are very standard uh, characteristics for crustaceans. Within subphylum crustacea, we're going to talk about order decapoda. Now, Notice we've skipped down a couple of levels on our, our classification tree here. That's okay. We're not going to go in the in-between. So with order decapoda, we have things like shrimps, crayfish, lobsters, and crabs. Uh, these are characterized by having five pairs of walking leg legs. The first pair are what we call chilipeds. They have pincers for capturing prey. And these are generally, again, a variety of very eating habits. We have scavengers. You have predators. You even have deposit feeders and filter feeders. Now we're only going to look at reproduction in order decapoda just because there's too many options out there for arthropods. Uh, but in this, decapods are generally hermaphroditic. They have modified appendages for mating and delivering sperm through what we call spermatophores. 
Most carry the eggs in a brood chamber in their interior abdomen. The female does. And you can actually tell the males and females apart, and we'll look at that in the lab. The larval stage uh, that you generally will see in the plankton is called zoea for crabs uh, and nopuluses for shrimp. And you'll see the zoea there on the bottom left, and it will metamorphose into what we call a megalopa. And then a little bit later, it will metamorphose again into what we would see as a little juvenile crab. And then from there, it will start getting bigger and bigger through successive molting until it becomes an adult size. The next class we're going to look at is class Cirripedia, and this is your barnacles. They're the only sessile crustaceans during their adult phase of their life cycle. They generally have a calcium carbonate shell, and they attach either directly on the surface of something, or they have stalks that attach. They are generally all filter feeders, and interestingly enough, they are, um, they are hermaphroditic, so they do have both uh, male and female parts within each individual, but they cannot fertilize themselves. They have to cross fertilize. The males do this with a very long extendable penis. Uh, and in fact, in terms of ratio to body size, it is the longest in the animal kingdom. However, this is also why it's important that barnacles settle near each other, which is what you see most often, because even with the long extension, there's only so far they can go. So superphylum arthropoda has a huge amount of importance. First of all, it is a huge food source. Because so many arthropods are part of the planktonic community in the ocean, specifically crustaceans, they are a big food source. A lot of these are also what we call holoplankton, meaning that they're plankton their entire lives, like little copepods and things like that, little amphipods. So they're huge food sources for the largest animals on the planet, whales, for example. And then, of course, uh, they're very good at nutrient cycling. Things like uh, hermit crabs and all the different cops and the benthos that stir up and eat deposits and, and are basically your detritivores. They also have various different symbiotic relationships with various cleaner shrimp that clean other fish and parasites and barnacles, all sorts of different things. Not to mention, they are a big part of the fishing industry for humans, so they're important to our own economics as well. Now we're going to get into one of my favorite uh, phylums, phylum echinodermata. And the Greek breakdown on this one is echinos means spiny derma skin out of to bear. So to bear spiny skin, which really makes sense with a sea urchin like this. So one of the biggest unique features, other than the fact that frankly, echinoderms are so different than everything else, um, would be the water vascular system. Uh, this is a network of water vessels that operate through hydraulic pressure. And they use this water system to power the tube feet. And those tube feet are the ones that you've probably seen before coming out of the bottom of the sea star and it helps it walk. So it's good for locomotion. It also helps in gas exchange, feeding, and even sensory perception. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But you can see the picture to the left in the middle there is of the tube feet of a sea star coming down. Uh, on the right, you'll see this diagram, and that diagram is really showing you the structure of the water vascular system within a sea star. Uh, you'll see more about that in the lab. Another component, of course, is they have calcareous endoskeletons. Who doesn't have calcareous something, right? Um, so they have an endoskeleton. Now, interestingly enough, because you see uh, sea stars and sea urchins especially as being relatively hard on the outside, you would think, well, aren't those exoskeletons? Well, the truth is, is there's living tissue that goes over the endoskeletons, which is why they're called an endoskeleton. Now, generally with adults, they have radial symmetry. We usually say pentamerous radial symmetry because you'll often see uh, the body broken up into five segments or various different groupings of five. Uh, and the interesting thing, in a, though, is that the larvae are actually bilateral, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, they are also triploblastic, so they have all three germ layers. But, oh, ho, ho, looky here. They are deuterostomes. This is big. Every other invertebrate phyla we've looked at so far are protostomes, except for echinoderms. Echinoderms are deuterostomes, meaning that 
as they go through gastrulation, that blast pore, when it forms, forms the anus, not the mouth. Why is that important? Guess what we are, folks? We are deuterostomes. I'll let you think on that for a minute, and let's go on. So for evolutionary connections here, um, the truth is, is that we believe that there is a common ancestor with chordates. And yes, we are in phylum chordata um, and other deuterostome groups. There was probably a split somewhere around 600 million years ago. So we're talking a long, long time ago. And there's some other clues about this as well. Remember, I told you the larvae is uh, bilateral instead of radial in terms of symmetry. On the right, you'll see an image of a bilateral echinoderm larvae. Now, here's the deal. The radial symmetry that we see in the adults is secondarily derived. Now, if we look at embryological development in most species, you'll often see earlier versions in the larval forms, uh, in the embryonic forms, and then they, those will metamorphose into the adult form. That's what we are seeing here. So echinoderms had a bilateral ancestor somewhere down the line. Now, before we go on to the rest of echinoderms, I just want to lay the groundwork that we've been sort of seeding throughout these uh, last couple of talks. So this shows time on the left with modern times uh, at the top and you know, ancient history towards the bottom. Uh, and we're going to sort of work our way through all of the different invertebrate phyla that we've dealt with so far. So first of all, you have what we call the ancestral protus. So we're probably talking something that was single cellular. At a some point, those different individual single celled organisms started to change. And it very well could be that they started working together very much like the different specialized cells we see in modern sponges. But notice that's the first branching that we see. Sponges go splitting off up to the current modern day. But everything else moves along and you see the term true tissues. Now remember when we talk about cladograms and we're talking about derived characteristics, that would be a derived characteristics after that ancestral protist developing true tissues. That's something sponges never did and still haven't done even to today. So from there, we have true tissues and we split into two different groups, the radiata and the bilateral triploblastic organisms. So the radiata we know are all diploblastic. We have your cnidarians and your tenophores. And again, they continue to evolve up into modern day. Now you have your bilateral and your triploblastic organisms splitting into protostomes and deuterostomes. Now your protostomes include all these invertebrate phyla we've been talking about today, uh, annelids, arthropods, mollusks, and a few we haven't talked about because they're mostly on land, but you do have marine examples, platyhelminthes and nematoda. But as deuterostomes go, look what you have. You have something called bryzo, which I know I haven't talked about which are, are interesting but unique. Uh, and you have echinoderms, which we're talking about now, and phylum chordata. For those of you who don't know, phylum chordata is our phylum. That's where you find all the vertebrates, all the large animals that we generally know and love and think about. Echinoderms made that split with us <laughs> into deuterostome territory. And even though they're radially symmetric, they are actually bilateral. They just secondarily went back to and reverted to radial symmetry. So this is just very interesting to see how things lay out from a taxonomic and an evolutionary scheme. This does not mean that we are directly related to echinoderms or any other invertebrate phyla. Remember, all of them continue to evolve into modern day, so you cannot say that. That's a misinterpretation of uh, what we understand about biology and evolution. What we can say is there are a highly likelihood of common ancestry between some of these different groups that are more or less connected. Now let's jump back into phylum echinodermata and look at the various different classes. So class Astrodia is up first. Here are your sea stars. And they are mostly all carnivores and scavengers. And they're really interesting because when they feed on something like the uh, sea star is uh, feeling, feeding on the clamshell on the top right picture, they literally eject their entire stomach into that shell and digest the animal inside and then suck it all back in. It's very, very cool. 
Um, in terms of reproduction, uh, they do go through asexual reproduction through fragmentation and regeneration. In fact, you can actually cut a sea star completely in half, and as long as you have the central nerve ring intact, you will grow two new sea stars. Kind of interesting. In terms of sexual reproduction, they do have external fertilization, so they release their gametes into the water column. Class Ophioridae would be your brittle stars, your basket stars, and they are called brittle stars because they break their arms off very easily. In fact, that's a escape mechanism for them uh, to be able to get away from predators. Um, they are carnivores and scavengers. They are, some of them are also deposit feeders, and some of them are also filter feeders, so there's quite a lot of options within there as well. Now, of course, uh, the member who exhibits the best uh, example of the echinoderm name, spiny skin, would be class echinoidea. These are your sea urchins, your sand dollars, uh, your sea biscuits. They are generally grazers and deposit feeders and scavengers. Some of them will take meat if it's lying around. It's kind of interesting. Um, they generally have external fertilization as well. Now, class holothuridae would be your sea cucumbers. And they're primarily all deposit or suspension feeders. And in fact, if you swim around in that bottom picture on the right, you'll see these little what we call fecal casts. Um, that's letting you know that there's a sea cucumber around. They literally consume a lot of the sand that's on the bottom. They eat all the detritus that's within it. And then they uh, defecate it back out on the other side. Um, almost every piece of sand in the ocean has gone that way at one point or another. Interestingly enough, they do have some cool adaptations. If they are threatened, a lot of them will actually uh, excrete these uh, tubules to try and um, distract or even entangle their predator that's coming after them. Uh, they can also, a few of them, eject their entire intestinal tract out into the water to try and uh, distract a predator and get away. So kind of interesting adaptations. Now, class Crinoidea is interesting because we thought, for the most part, a lot of them were all extinct uh, until one day when we were discovering things in the deep sea, we saw a what we call a stocked crinoid, and that's the picture on the bottom uh, right there. Uh, the fossils are on the left, and those fossils uh, were found long before we found the living crinoids in the deep sea. Uh, interestingly enough, though, we do have something called sea lilies and also feather stars that are part of the crinoid group as well, and uh, the feather stars you'll find on uh, coral reefs as well. Uh, they are primarily suspension feeders, so they're filter feeding all the time. All right, so the importance of echinoderms. First of all, oddly enough, they are actually a food source for some species, sea otters, for example, and spider crabs. It's limited, but they're there. Um, we also actually eat them in some uh, cultures. They like to eat like sea urchin roe, which is the eggs of the sea urchin, for example, uh, which is kind of interesting. It's used in sushi in Asia. They are also a major predator. A lot of the sea stars especially are very big predators of other invertebrates. Um, the diadema, the long spine urchins you see on the left, um, are a huge keystone species in the Caribbean. And they feed on algae, allowing coral polyps to grow, especially settle out new coral polyps from larval forms. They need bare rock to do that. And sea cucumbers are literally the ocean's cleanup crew. They're constantly going through the deposits and eating the detritus and turning that back over into uh, the food web. So they are very, very important. Phew, that was a lot of information and a lot of phyllodes that we went through very, very quickly. Um, so... Turning it over to you, here's your question. Invertebrates play lots of roles within an ecosystem. Describe three important environmental functions provided by invertebrates you learned about today. They can be from three different invertebrates. They can be all from one. It doesn't really matter. Uh, give me some examples. So until next time, keep thinking.